Let's turn to John chapter 20. Everyone, we've got a word today, and it's a simple word, just one word that I want us to grab hold of from John 20, and that is the word believe. Everyone say believe. believe. So John 20, verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with doors locked for fear of the Jewish leadership, Jesus came and stood among them, and don't we need this word today, and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, what everyone? Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, put my hands into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came, stood among them, and said a third time, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen yet have believed. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. The word believe is mentioned 84 times in John's gospel. It's an important word because it's the word that opens the door to Jesus Christ. Believe. Now, believe on its own makes no sense. I believe in unicorns. That kind of somehow diminishes the word believe, doesn't it? I believe in the braves, well, in my experience in America, that works about 52% of the time. But there are some disappointing days as well. You know, a few years ago, my rugby team tried using that word believe to try and encourage everybody. It's like the worst season we'd had in years. Believe doesn't always work when it's connected to something that we don't have to believe in. I believe I can fly. I'd say don't try it unless you've got a parachute. Uh, but we know what the song means. It's a metaphor. But the resurrection is not a metaphor. We believe because Jesus Christ actually did die on the cross and came again to life. It's been a trend in the last hundred years or so for some theologians to say, well, it doesn't really matter about the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. It just matters that there's something going on in our hearts. We're keeping the rumor of God alive. Let me tell you, it's not a, a rumor. God is alive in Jesus Christ. And if you're thankful, would you give him praise, everyone? For he lives. There's two more verses that summarize the first Easter day. So what do we do with Easter Sunday? There are two following verses. I'm going to put them on the screen. But it's literally the two verses after where we've been reading at the, the end of John 20. And after describing the Easter events, it's like John takes a time out and says, I'm going to summarize the entire gospel, and I'm going to summarize the entire Easter story and tell us what relevance it has to all of our lives. And this is what he says. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not even recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And so that's our message this morning. What do we do with the resurrection? Well, we believe. Well, what is it, pastor, that we believe? I'll spend most of the time on that. I'll spend a little section right at the end emphasizing how we believe and what that looks like in our daily lives. First of all, what we believe. On the first Easter Sunday in John 20, right at the beginning of that chapter, Mary meets Jesus at the tomb. She's there actually to grieve and to be near his grave. She's witnessed Christ on the cross with the rest of the city in full view of thousands of people. She, know, she knows that he's dead. You probably know the story of the Cathedral of Notre Dame burning uh, this week in the city of Paris, and the whole city, it seemed, came out to watch, and we could also say mourn for that cathedral. 
And so the great city of Jerusalem came out in force and saw the lifeless body of Jesus Christ, his body lifeless, perishing. Mary was not expecting to see that same crucified Jesus again. And so on the Sunday, she's in the vicinity of the ruins of his body, just like those that came to Notre Dame the next day, just to look, seeing the right thing, just to kind of be there and and be in, in shock almost at what happened. And so Mary goes there almost with little faith. She went with much obedience, but little faith. And then she meets the risen Lord Jesus. And later, Peter and John run to the empty tomb. They know something's up. They're breathless, almost with excitement and confusion. But it's all settled when Jesus walks in that room in verse 19 and says, peace be with you. What do we believe about Easter Sunday? First of all, we believe that Easter Sunday is important because Jesus died for sins. If a man simply died and came alive again, well, that would be an interesting story. But if he was God's appointed one to be a sacrifice for sin and then came alive, that's something pretty amazing. So that's the first thing we declare. Jesus died for our sins. The resurrected one is also the one who was crucified for us. This is good news. Everyone say good news. I know that some of you have heard it before. Some of us have heard it for many, many years. Let's just remind ourselves this is the best news that anybody could possibly have. No matter what's going on in your life, be encouraged with this today. Jesus Christ died for sins. You know, I was excited for Tiger Woods winning the Masters again. Uh, it's the first time we've been in America for uh, 13 and a half years, the first time that Tiger's won the Masters since we were here. Uh, when we arrived here, he was the reigning Masters champion. Didn't think it would take so long. But I was excited, and this is a picture that I took. Can you show us the picture of Tiger? I took this picture uh, in September at East Lake Golf Club. It was the Saturday morning when Tiger shot 65, and my daughter Sarah and I walked around. These were exciting times. And Michael, I know you were there on the Sunday uh, when he won at East Lake, and that was exciting. But then to win the Masters was another thing. But let me tell you something. I'm sure these characters were very pleased for Tiger, but Brooks Kepka nearly won the Masters, and Xander Schaufle was probably a little disappointed because he could have won, and so could Francesco Molinari. And by the way, you try spelling Brooks Kepta, Xander Schaufle, and Francesco Molinari, it's not easy. But you know, even the most popular sporting victories are not necessarily good news for everybody. But when Jesus died on the cross, there's no doubt whatsoever that we can all see this as good news for all time that never fades. Christ died for my sins. And in 1 Corinthians 15, the apostle Paul says, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. What do I need to get ready for Easter Sunday? I've got to get the, thank you, especially for the ladies that make the house look lovely and all the cooking. What do I need to get right for Easter Sunday? There are some important things we want to get right for this day, but the most important thing, the thing of first importance, is that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. This is God's plan. It was no accident, and it fulfills the Old Testament Scriptures. John mentions this a lot because he wants unbelievers to believe and to see that the Scriptures are reliable. Now, you know, we live in a pretty judgmental culture these days. You'd probably agree with me. One side shouts at the other. We seem to have lost the ability to be civil. If we don't like something, we use very strong language. This is disgusting. This is terrible. And we use this very strong language. That's kind of where we are as a culture right now. Can I suggest to you that every time we judge somebody, and every one of us has done this, we prove that we have sinned, and we prove that we need a Savior. Let me give you this in in print, Romans 2 verse 1. You therefore have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else, who's done that? Come on, everyone put your hands in the air. I know we've all done it. You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you're condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. Wow, that verse of scripture is a gotcha moment for every one of us. It's like, (gasps) I realize now that I'm in sin and I need a savior. Here's the good news. Jesus Christ died for sinners and Jesus is with us even today. You know, um, amen. Now I watched one of those YouTube videos uh, the other day. I don't know whether you ever watched dog videos or cat videos, but someone sent it to me. Uh, It was a cat video. 
And by the way, where I came from, the cats saved us 600 years ago from the Black Death because they, they you know, killed all the rats and everything. So the Brits kind of liked the cats because they kind of saved us and everything. I know Americans don't like cats. You kind of think they're like lazy squirrels with a sense of entitlement, right? Uh, anyway, someone sends me this, but let your heart be moved by this story. I saw this cat video, and this poor little kitty cat, he's, he's actually deep down in a quagmire. It appears to be quicksand. And this young man is trying to rescue this poor little kitty, and he's, he's trying to make sure that he doesn't go into the quicksand. You can see him thinking, well, don't die in the quicksand because it's like it's only a cat. Anyway, so he, he's trying to nonetheless save this cat. He gets a stick. He's trying to drag the cat closer to himself. It's a really awkward moment, but you can see that he, he needs to save the cat. And by the way, Jesus rescues us from hell. Jesus Christ rescues us from sin. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you know that while we were still powerless, Christ died for sinners. We can't reach up to God, but God reached down to us and rescues us in Jesus. Amen. So, so this young man, he's trying to reach the cat. Let me tell you, he gets hold of the cat. I'm thinking, this is a great YouTube video. This works really well. But there's something that happens afterwards that's really interesting. This cat is caked in maybe three or four inches of mud. He's probably been there for a while. He's exhausted, and there's just mud all over this little cat. And uh, some of you are still not feeling sympathetic, but I'll keep going all the same. But there's, there's mud all over him. And so this young man starts scraping, scraping these layers of mud off the cat because there's no way he's going to survive. And if you've risked your life to save somebody, you want to make sure that they get fully clean and don't just kind of get out in the mud, caked in mud. And so patiently, this young man scrapes the mud off the cat, and then patiently, there's more to it. He gets water, and he starts washing the cat and caring for the cat. And I just want to say, say, friends, Jesus Christ has delivered me from the penalty of sin, but he also delivers me from the power of sin as well. We don't just want to get our ticket to heaven and look filthy and look dirty. We need to be cleaned up. The ministry of our church is to transform lives, families, and communities through the revived people of Jesus Christ. We want to look like revived people. We don't just want to look like the world. We want to be transformed people. We need our minds to be transformed daily as Christ Jesus works his wonders in our own lives. If you're thankful that we're delivered from the power of sin, the penalty of sin, give him praise, everybody. Isn't that great? So, so we don't just go, um, Lord, I confess my sins to you, kind of go to confession, as it were, and then carry on sinning. We confess our sins, and we follow Christ, and we ask him to make us more like him. It's good news that Jesus died for our sins. Now, not long before Jesus died, he goes to a place called Jericho, and he meets this little fellow called Zacchaeus, who was hated by the community because he was a bully and a swindler. He was the equivalent of a pimp or a drug pusher. When he met Jesus and realized that Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost, Zacchaeus began to change there and then. Just seeing Jesus communicated to Zacchaeus, I cannot stay in this filth any longer. And instead of being a swindler and a cheat and a liar and a bully and a manipulator, there and then he begins to change. And he says, everything I've ever stolen, which is basically all his income, I'm going to give back four times over. By the end of the day, this stingy, mean, vile man becomes the most generous man in the community. That's the power of the gospel. That's the good news on this Easter Sunday, that the one who rose again was the one who died on the cross, became my sin, and even gives me a new nature and the power to walk in a new life. Who needs that new life, everybody? Who needs that new life? We need the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, Jesus Christ was buried. I want to pause on this for a few seconds, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried. The same Jesus was laid in a new tomb, let there be no doubt. Notre Dame burned. It took 182 years to build. A similar structure, the temple in Jerusalem, people said to Jesus, hey, Jesus, this is an impressive building. And Jesus said, destroy this temple and it shall rise in three days. And everybody misunderstood him. How is he going to rebuild the temple? How is he going to rebuild Notre Dame in just three days? He was talking about his body. I tell you what, it's a much harder thing to raise a dead man even than to build a cathedral. But let me say that Jesus Christ's body was buried and three days later he rose again. So thirdly, Jesus was resurrected. 
that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Ain't no grave going to hold his body down. Ain't no grave going to hold my body down. And so he rose again. The crucified Jesus is the risen Jesus. The, the risen Lord Jesus is the one who was crucified. Is that the end of the story? No, there's still more to run. Jesus appeared. And that he appeared to Cephas, or Peter, and then to the 12. That's what happened. That's in here in John 20. Jesus appeared to him, then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. In other words, there's a, whole bunch, there's a great big bunch of alibis. Now, all those that doubt the resurrection will say, these poor, sad people, they were just hallucinating. Let me tell you, experts tell us two people cannot hallucinate the same thing. Think about it. That would be pretty coincidental, wouldn't it, to hallucinate the same thing? It's not possible for two people to hallucinate. It's certainly not possible for 500 people to be fooled that easily. They saw Jesus in their midst, most of whom are still living. Paul could say there are still plenty of witnesses who can say, we were there. It wasn't just one of us in an isolated place. Have you noticed all those UFO sightings or ghost sightings? There's like, there's nobody there. There's like one person. They say, I, I saw it. I honestly did. No, there's 500 people all at once seeing Jesus. Jesus appeared not just on that occasion, but on many occasions so that we could be sure that he's alive and that he appeared. Hallelujah. And then Jesus ascended. Where is Jesus right now? Jesus is at the right hand of God. Now, he's also very close to us, too. And we can imagine him walking into the room and saying, peace be with you, because when someone believes and receives Jesus Christ, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and so the Holy Spirit brings the risen Christ into our lives. Jesus said that we need to, to uh, hear the, the door knocking, open the door, Christ will enter in, we enter his life, he enters our life. And so the ascended Lord Jesus at the right hand is powerfully present for us today. On one occasion, Michelangelo, the great artist, turned on his fellow artists in a spirit of indignation and said, why do you keep filling gallery after gallery with endless pictures on the one theme of Christ in weakness, Christ on the cross, and most of all, Christ hanging dead? Why do you concentrate on the passing episode as if it were his last work, as if the curtain dropped on him with disaster and defeat? That dreadful scene lasted a few hours, but to unending eternity, Christ is alive. The stone has been rolled away, and he rules and reigns and triumphs. And so, friends, Jesus Christ is alive. At Easter time, we think of a bloody tree and an empty tomb and an occupied throne. And we have the Holy Spirit. We can know Christ helping us in our life situations all the time. And I think on occasions like this, we kind of go like, oh yeah, it's, it's of first importance. This is the most important thing. We drift, we get caught up with all kinds of other things. But I'm hoping as we assemble together today that we're reminding ourselves that this alive Jesus can also be alive in our own hearts as well. Now, Thomas had to deal with some issues in his thinking. As soon as he meets Christ personally, his thinking begins to change radically. Perhaps we need to just face to face with Christ again, and he will change the way that we think. That's what it is to be transformed. We're transformed with the renewing of our mind. There are some objectors I've heard over the years. Judas was really a hero, wasn't he? No. The facts are clear. The biblical record is clear. He was a thief. He betrayed Jesus, and he refused to repent. Well, wasn't it anti-Semitic to blame Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin, and the Jewish leaders? That's anti-Semitic. Hey, the Bible makes it clear. All are responsible, Jew and Gentile. Pilate and the Romans, they're the ones that actually ended up physically murdered him. But let me tell you, the good news is that Christ came first for the Jew and for the Gentiles. Jesus himself was Jewish. People will create all kinds of objections that are simply not true. Well, the gospel account has been twisted. No. Peter and John, uh, have, we've got their writings. We've got the writings of the apostles. The, the biblical record is God's true witness. And then there are some that say, well, I'm like Thomas. I've had people say this to me over the years. Well, I'm just like Thomas. I like to see things for myself. 
And it's almost like we say, well, therefore, because I'm, I'm smarter than everybody else, I have permission to use the same line as Thomas, even though Thomas, in one sense, was a bit dopey. He's speaking this, and it's like Jesus walks in. Unless I say, oh, hello, Jesus. Uh, that, that, that humbled Thomas pretty quickly. But there are some that almost want to say, I, I expect God to appear to me. I've literally had people say to me face to face on many occasions, God just needs to reveal himself to me. And I'm going to say, friends, he already has revealed himself to you through the Lord Jesus Christ. The witness could not be more clear. In fact, there's even a blessing here. Blessed were those who see, Thomas, but blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. There is a blessing in believing today. Even though we weren't there with the apostles, there's a blessing in us believing today. And I thank God that in Fayetteville, Georgia, Sonoya, Georgia, we've witnessed a gathering of God's people saying, I believe that Jesus Christ is alive. Isn't that glorious? The 2,000 years in this unbelieving world that people are assembling in the name of Jesus to say, the most important thing that I can do today is to give glory and honor to the Lord. I believe. What do we believe? We believe that Jesus died, was buried, rose again, appeared, ascended, is alive. And let me tell you something, he's coming back as well. That's what we believe. I encourage you, believe it. Believe it with all your heart. So in the moments we've got left, you may have heard this before. Perhaps you're hearing it for the first time. That's great. But in the time that we've got left, so pastor, well, how then do I believe? Seriously, what does this look? What, what's realistic for me to, to, to live, you know, for me to believe? How do I believe this? Well, think about the ordinary people in the Easter story. What were they like before the death, resurrection, appearing ascension? of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit comes. What were they like before that? Well, they were fearful. I mean, Peter's cutting someone's ear off. He's denying Jesus. People are running away. They're confused. They're hiding. After the resurrection, after the ascension, after the coming of the Holy Spirit, what are they like? You know what the apostles are like? They're just out among the people. It, it's it's the, the day of Pentecost occurs in Jerusalem. Thousands of people have gathered, and they're just among the people. They're not ashamed. Even though the authorities have only killed Jesus a few days before, there they are among the people, and they're saying, repent, believe. They were pleading with, with the people, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. They were out among the people, and the people could see there was something in their eyes. There was fire in their soul. Jesus Christ was living in these same people, and this profoundly affected the city so much so that by the end of the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people repented of their sins, believed in Jesus Christ, and were baptized. How do I believe? What do I believe? But how do I believe? I'll tell you what. You give it all you've got. You lean completely into it. You entirely rest upon it. What is the it? It's believing in Jesus Christ. Don't just believe a little bit. Believe with all your heart. Believing a little won't work very much. Let me tell you something. When you rely completely on God and dive into the things of God, Oh, there's such a blessing in doing that. Believe with everything that you have and everything that you've got. Is anyone going to agree with me on that one? I, I, we can't believe a little. We, we must believe a lot with all that we've got. So very simply, can we say, how do we believe? We turn from our sin. Other things can take our affections so easily. We get distracted. We get drawn in. We get lured in. We have to repent of those things. Get out of the mud, get out of the mire. We need to be cleaned up, washed clean, made fit for service. We turn from our sin and we turn towards the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no good saying, sometimes people say, well, pray for me. It's like, I'm happy to pray for you, but it may be that you need to repent, get out of the mire, and get cleaned up. That's what many, don't just say pray for me like a, that salvation by proxy. I mean, the pastor praying for you won't save you. You've got to be saved yourself. You've got to be responsible for your own soul and for your own life. Pray for me, pray for me. Well, sure, we'll pray for you, but please repent of your sins and get right with God, amen? And there's no good also just saying, well, I, I confess my sin, I confess my sin, I'm just going to carry on the way I've been. No, confess our sin and let's walk in the new life that Christ brings us. Secondly, we trust in Jesus Christ. That's what believe means. It means to entirely rely upon him. You know, there's a, a chair here that I've been sitting in this morning, and I could say, I believe in chairs. 
I believe in seats. But it's not till you've actually tested that, and, and all of you are doing that right now. John, is your seat working? Yes, I mean, you're, you're, you're committed to the idea of the chair. And uh, if you think that chair is going to collapse, what are you going to do? You're not going to sit in that. To trust Jesus Christ is to say, I'm committed to him. I, I'm testing it out, as it were, and I know that he will not fail me. Let me tell you something. While I've been following Christ, he has never once failed me. He's never let me down. Sometimes I've gone, how long, O oh Lord? But he never fails me. He never leaves me, never forsakes me. Trust in Christ. Tim Keller said, if Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry any of what he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. Stop putting limitations on God, my friend. Stop saying, I'm going to do this for Jesus, but I'm not going to do this, 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 all these things he's told me to do. Believe with everything that you've got. Trust in all of God's word and then tender your resignation to self-rule. That's what it means to believe. How do we believe? I say, I'm not in charge any longer. God, you are. Here you are, Lord. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to obey you. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. I'm going to do what you want, God. I tend my resignation to self-rule. That's what baptism is. It says, I die and I rise again. Do you know, by the way, we've got baptisms taking place. The more you've sinned, the longer we hold you down for. That was just, that, that was a joke. That was a joke. Sorry. That's not true at all. It's the same for everybody. It's momentary. I mean, it's, it's a fraction of a second. Honestly, we've never lost anyone. So, splosh and up you get. Die to self rise again to a new life in Jesus Christ, trusting him. And I'll tell you what, to be baptized is an act of faith because it says, even though it seems a little different and it's not what I do every day and you only have to do it once, even though it's a little weird, even though it's a little uncomfortable, if you say it, Lord, then I will do it. And so baptism is a good beginning point for following Christ because the rest of your life is to trust him even when it doesn't make any sense to do so. And so, on that day of Pentecost, the same Peter who'd run away, who tried to chop someone's ear off, says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What does it look like to believe? For Peter and John, it meant to run to the tomb and then preach on Pentecost. For Thomas, it was to change his mind and to humble himself. For Mary, it was to tell others and to gather with God's people and pray. And for the early church, it was to be baptized and to belong to the community and do stuff together and see God do awesome things in our lives. And for you and I, to believe does mean to be completely transformed and changed. And our life becomes not about me but our life becomes about Jesus. And I care about what God thinks, not what man thinks. I stay with God's facts and not man's fads. And I put Christ first in everything, 365 days of the year, 24-7, with everything I've got. That's what it means to believe. I want us to look at this video now that we're going to run of the empty tomb that will encourage our hearts.
Hit her. Zurich. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Church, let us believe.